morning, everyone. We have a few things to cover today. First, we'll have our weekly education update from Secretary French, a quick modeling update from Commissioner Pichek, as well as our usual topics from Dr. Levine and Secretary Smith. As you know, this week we opened up vaccinations to all those over the age of 50, as well as members of the BIPOC community and their households 16 and over. We now have almost 40% of all adult Vermonters having received at least one dose, and over 85% of those 65 and older who are at the highest risk of hospitalization and death. In this category, we continue to rank first in the nation, which will help prevent hospitalizations and deaths as the Northeast sees an uptick, which Commissioner Pichek will speak about in a few moments. The progress we've made to protect the most vulnerable has been due to our age banding strategy and our focus on others at risk like those with certain underlying conditions. It's also helped make Vermont among the top 10 states for vaccine administration overall. And as a reminder, based on current supply, we're only 17 days away from those 16 and over to be eligible. That's less than three weeks, just a little over two weeks. I know some are concerned that other states have already opened up more broadly, but as a reminder, states receive the same percentage of vaccines based on population. And just because a state opens up to a larger group, it doesn't mean they're going to vaccinate any more people. The supply is the same. It's just simple math. It may also be opening up because supply has outpaced demand due to resistance to the vaccine. But that's not the case in Vermont. And we're seeing very high uptake and very high interest. With our approach, we can be nimble and adjust the number of appointments based on supply so that we can fill slots efficiently after an age band opens. That's why. Unlike other states, we haven't had widespread cancellation of appointments or seen people have to schedule their appointments months away or had some of the most vulnerable still waiting to be vaccinated. But regardless of our success, we still have some work to do over the next four weeks when everyone is eligible. Because even though we protected those at greatest risk of hospitalization and death, increased cases can still cause disruption in the classroom at the office or on the job site. So it's critical we pay attention and follow the health guidance we have in place. I, uh, I also had hoped to roll out our reopening of the blueprint today, uh, but we've decided to wait until next week. In the meantime, let's all do our part by wearing masks, keeping our distance, avoiding crowds, and washing our hands. Next, I'll turn it over to Secretary French for our education update, but first, I wanted to let you know that we're updating the recreational sports guidance today to go along with school spring sports guidance that was pu published last week. This is just a framework for sports leagues so they're ready when they're allowed to do so. Secretary Moore is on the line, can answer any questions you may have about that. Uh, but at this point, I'll turn it over to Secretary French. I begin my report with an update on the weekly surveillance testing for school staff. This week, we tested 1,472 school staff statewide. Uh, to date, one case of COVID-19 has been identified by the testing. Uh, this translates into a positivity rate of 0.08%. Uh, the statewide positivity rate is 2.1%. We are in the process of reviewing next steps with the surveillance testing program. Uh, but no final decision has been made at this point. The school vaccination program has gone very well. Uh, to date, about 80% of all school staff have been vaccinated. I want to thank the health department, our other state partner agencies, and school districts for making this happen so quickly. Uh, Secretary Smith will provide more information on the vaccination program in his update. We made progress this week on drafting an update for what will be a major and perhaps a final revision of our safe and healthy schools guidance. This guidance was originally created last summer to help our schools reopen in September. The last time we updated the guidance was in October in anticipation of the holiday period. 
We are now revising the guidance a third time with a focus on helping our schools operate in the remaining months of the school year when we expect conditions for the virus to improve as widespread vaccination starts to make an impact. We are also factoring in the cumulative negative effects of the pandemic on our students and seeking to strike the balance between the risks of COVID-19 as compared to the risks of their healthy development and academic success. A major feature of the guidance is that it's now a much smaller document. Previously, it was over 40 pages. Uh, the new version is about 20 pages. We're able to reduce its size by condensing some sections and by linking out to external resources. For example, the disinfection section is much smaller. When the guidance was first written in the summer, a lot of attention was put on articulating detailed disinfection procedures. This section has now been condensed and links out to external resources such as those provided by the CDC. In terms of CDC recommendations, uh, we are shifting our distancing standards to the new CDC standard of three feet. We are making this change after the Health the Team has evaluated the recent CDC recommendation and the research behind it. That research basically concludes there is no significant difference between three feet and six feet as a mitigation strategy in schools. We also know that Europe and other New England states have been operating safely with a three foot standard for some time. Previously, we had adopted the three foot standard for students in grades K through six, but six feet has been our standard for students in the upper grades. Now all students K through 12 will be under the same distancing standard of three feet. The distancing standard does function as a minimum standard and in guidance. Districts may operate under a more stringent distancing standard until they enact the new standard. This will provide some flexibility to schools as they plan to implement more in-person instruction. We have heard consistently from schools that the current six foot distancing requirement has been a barrier to their goal of implementing more in-person instruction. By making this change in our guidance, I expect we will see more schools move to full in-person instruction in the coming weeks. We are now in the process of getting feedback on the draft guidance from our education stakeholder groups. I expect we will publish the revised guidance next week. We did publish a smaller guidance document this week on the use of school facilities for the summer. School, bu school buildings will be open for fairly normal use this summer, but there will be some requirements around safety and mitigation strategies. This week, uh, we also published our waiver for standardized testing. In Vermont, that testing is called SBAC. Uh, you can view our waiver proposal on the AOE website. As part of the waiver process, we are required to post the waiver proposal for public comment. Uh, we welcome comments on our proposal and there's a link to an email address on our website to do so. Our waiver proposal follows the approved waiver template outlined by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, the federal government is requiring us to hold the test. Our waiver proposal requests a waiver of the accountability provisions, which include a waiver from the 95% participation rate. This is the approach that most states are taking. A few states uh, submitted more elaborate waiver requests before the U.S. Department of Education announced the actual waiver process. Uh, we are now seeing those uh, other waiver requests being denied. Uh, notably, South Carolina and Georgia had their waivers designed recently and uh, denied recently, and Oregon's uh, was returned uh, for further clarification. I am confident our waiver request will be approved since it conforms to the required waiver process. Uh, we will submit the waiver request at the end of April after the close of the required public comment period. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichak. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary French, and good morning, everybody. Uh, we wanted to provide a brief update, as the governor said, on the COVID-19 situation in the Northeast, and also provide some further details on our case demographics here in Vermont as well. Taking a look first at the national heat map, we can see that some parts of the country are experiencing more significant case growth that's leading to more active cases and a higher degree of risk. Again, we've mentioned Michigan, but Michigan in particular jumps out, but so too does Minnesota, Utah, parts of Missouri, and certainly parts of the Northeast as well. Many of these parts of the country also happen to be places where the B117 variant from the UK is being detected at greater frequency in a per capita uh, distribution. 
This is certainly true for Michigan, Minnesota, Utah, and also parts of the Northeast as well. And when we look at the top 10 states by infection rate, we can see that the increased growth of the B11 variant does appear to be having a significant impact on case growth. Other than Michigan, the other states with the highest per capita rate include those located in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, including Vermont. Looking more closely at New England and New York, we see that all of the states around Vermont are seeing their cases rise. And most concerning are Massachusetts and Connecticut, who are also seeing their hospitalizations rise as well. The remaining states have seen their hospitalization numbers remain relatively flat, and the death rates are still continuing to fall largely. We will want to keep a close eye on this data in particular in the weeks to come, since in the past a rise in cases would usually precede a rise in hospitalizations and a rise in deaths. But with much progress being made uh, with the vaccination programs across uh, Vermont and the other uh, Northeast states, we hope to see a change in that progression in the weeks ahead. Turning to Vermont's data, you can see that uh, there's a continued rise in cases over the last few days. The Vermont 14-day case rate average is close to an all-time high, and the seven-day case rate average is, in fact, uh, at an all-time high for the pandemic. And when we look back at the forecast that we presented this Tuesday that was developed on Monday, you can see that the case growth so far this week puts us much more clearly on the trajectory uh, with the higher case growth rate than the one showing cases more stable uh, through the next few weeks into April. Now looking a little bit more closely at our case demographics, we've talked uh, for a number of weeks about how our median age had been uh, sloping downward, falling below 30 uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and now standing at 27 years old. Um, and that median age is going down mostly because we're seeing the most vulnerable be protected, while at the same time we're seeing increased growth rates in our younger populations. And this chart here shows you exactly by age band where that growth is occurring, uh, in particular focusing on the month of March when cases started to rise again uh, more, uh, at a more significant rate. You'll see that as we talked about in the past, those that are the most vulnerable and the most vaccinated, those over 70, they've actually seen their cases decrease about 54% uh, through the month of March. The 60-year-olds who have a fair amount of vaccination at this point, their rates have stayed pretty much steady, uh, rising about 2%. But then you'll see the groups that are largely at this point uh, unvaccinated, or at least not close to having a majority of the population vaccinated, those in their um, below 60 down to 30 are seeing their cases rise anywhere between 35% into the 50%. Uh, but most concerning are the youngest Vermonters. Uh, those uh, 20 to 29 years old, their case rates have increased 50% through the month of March. And those also in the 10 to 19 year old group have seen their case rates increase just over 100%. So we're seeing it here in our case rates clearly that the most vulnerable, also the most vaccinated, are continuing to see their rates hold steady or decrease for those in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, those in the middle ages are seeing uh, their case rates increase, certainly, uh, but most significantly are the increases that we're seeing in the youngest Vermonters, those um, in their 20s and in their teens. The next slide will show us that age demographic with a little bit more granularity. This is looking at four different age groups between zero and 29 years old. And you'll see that the age group that stands out most clearly are those 18 to 24 years old, where much of the case growth has happened, and certainly much of the cases have occurred uh, over the last month or so. Followed that is the 10 to 17 year old group. And then last is the 25 to 29 and the zero to nine year old Vermonters. So, it's not so much the youngest Vermonters, and it's not so much those in their late 20s, but particularly those in their teenage years and 18-year-old uh, to 24-year-olds. So as the governor mentioned, uh, certainly as Dr. Levine will mention, we really need uh, these age groups to do everything that they can uh, to protect themselves, protect their families, uh, get tested frequently, and uh, follow the public health guidance to the greatest degree that they can. Looking at the next slide, just showing the impact of these uh, case rates on our hospitalization numbers, 
you'll see that the rate of hospitalization among our most vulnerable, those over 70, uh, has decreased over the months of uh, January, February, and March. While those hospitalization rates for those under 70 years old uh, have uh, remained uh, relatively stable uh, at 57 in January, dipping down to 42 in February, and then uh, increasing again to 51 in March. So we're not yet, of course, seeing the impact of lower hospitalization uh, on that younger group uh, because they have not yet uh, been uh, fully vaccinated and had the opportunity to get fully vaccinated, but will uh, in the weeks uh, ahead, certainly. You'll also see that the average age of hospitalization has dipped down uh, each month as well as fewer vulnerable individuals, older individuals, end up in the hospital uh, month over month. The final uh, graph that we wanted to show you is really um, an analysis of the relative risk that COVID-19 presents with Vermont data through the end of March. So we talk a lot about the most vulnerable, those that are over 70, and you'll see from the case graph that they are uh, at a severely greater risk of hospitalization and death compared to the reference group, which are 39-year-olds in this example. But you'll also see that those in their 60s are at a much higher rate of hospitalization and a much higher risk of death than those in their 30s. You'll also see that 50-year-olds, the story is the same. Those that are um, in their 50s have a much greater risk of hospitalization and death. The same is true for those in their 40s, although those rates certainly do improve. And then on the flip side, those that are under 30 years old, you can see that they actually have a greater risk at this point based on the data of getting infected with COVID-19. Their rates are higher than the reference group that we're looking at, but at the same time, their risk of hospitalization is lower than 30-year-olds, certainly lower than uh, 40, 50, and 60-year-olds as well. And you'll also see that fortunately, we haven't had any deaths to date in these lower age categories as well. So I think this graph helped show why it's important to stick to our vaccination program and why we did it in the first place is to not only protect those that were most significantly vulnerable, those over 70, but each age band progressively uh, has less risk, but they still have more risk than those that are younger than them. Uh, and we're seeing that in the data as it plays out. So uh, at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation uh, over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Pichek, and good morning, everyone. Today, I will provide an update of our progress with the vaccination program, as well as an update on our efforts uh, in Essex County and the reopening of our senior center and adult day centers. As you know, we opened registration for Vermonters age 50 and older on Monday. As of this morning, more than 27,800 Vermonters in that age group have made an appointment, including those that have already been vaccinated through our eligibility criteria. That is over 60% of this age group. Yesterday, we opened registration to our BIPOC Vermonters. Throughout the day yesterday, more than 3,000 BIPOC Vermonters and household members have made appointments. This is a 7% improvement, and we are happy to see these numbers. In terms of our overall progress, as of this morning, 213,700 people have been vaccinate, vaccinated against COVID-19. 86,900 have received their first dose of the vaccine, and 126,800 have received their first and last dose. And as Secretary French said, 80% of teachers and school staff have made appointments or received a vaccine. 3,476 homebound individuals have been vaccinated, and we've added capacity and staffing to reduce the length of time homebound Vermonters have to wait for an appointment. Those that are homebound and qualify for vaccination can call 833-722-0860. That's 833-722-0860, Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4.30 for an appointment. Now, to all our community members in Essex County, we are making significant efforts to improve vaccination rates 
and we need participation from everyone in that county. With the assistance of Calix and Newport EMS, we are deploying mobile clinics to nine locations in Essex County on April 10th and 11th. Please spread the word and, and make an appointment to be vaccinated. By tomorrow, you can make an appointment online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. If you are unable to sign up online, you can call 855-722-7878. They will be able to accommodate only a limited number of walk-ins, so please schedule an appointment. Finally, we are discussing the possibility of working with a healthcare partner just over the border in New Hampshire to administer vaccine to Vermont residents in that county. I will update you again when more information is, av is available. Let's move on to senior centers and adult day centers. Social isolation has been a real problem during the pandemic for many Vermonters, especially for older adults, putting them at higher risk for poor health and outcomes. Opportunities for social connections, such as healthy meals, exercise, and group activities are key to older Vermonters' long-term physical, mental, and emotional health and well-being. Adult day centers and senior centers are vital providers in our age aging services network, helping to keep over 15,000 Vermonters healthy and at home while aging. They've been closed for group activities since November of 2020, only allowed to serve people one at a time. With most older Vermonters now vaccinated, we are now ready to allow these centers to reopen for group activities such as exercise, the arts, and social groups. The Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, Dale, and the Department of Health have corroborated with, have collaborated to revise reopening guidelines and guidance, which considers changes that may be made as more Vermonters are vaccinated for COVID-19. Key health and safety measures, such as wearing a mask, maintaining physical distance, will continue to be important at all centers. As a result, many will open with reduced visitation. Dale and VDH have worked closely with adult day providers and senior centers to review the revised reopening guidance to answer questions and provide technical assistance. We recognize that not all centers will open at the same time and each center must determine their reopening date based on their site's readiness. Some have been closed for almost a year and may need more time to prepare, including hiring and training staff. A listing of adult day centers and senior centers, uh, their reopening guidance and their estimated reopening timeframes are available at the Dale website at dale.vermont.gov. As you are probably aware, and as we have pointed out at this press conference, COVID cases have recently been reported at the Vermont Veterans Home in Bennington. Some family members of residents at the Veterans Home are concerned that not all staff wish to be vaccinated at this long-term care facility. Loved ones are not only concerned about the increased risk to residents in this facility, but also that when there is a positive case, visitation or quarantine restrictions may be imposed on the facility depending on the circumstances of the positive case or cases. Currently, 95% of the residents have been vaccinated, but only 40% of the patient-facing direct care staff have been vaccinated. Recently, Dr. Levine held a virtual town hall with staff at the facility in, order, in an effort to improve vaccination acceptance, particularly among LNAs, LPNs, and RNs. We plan on scheduling another meeting in the near future to ensure we are able to speak with all shifts in an attempt to increase the percentage of vaccination with the patient facing direct care staff. As a reminder, um, those age 40 and older will be eligible for vaccination appointments starting on Monday at 8.15 a.m. You can make an appointment at one of our health uh, partner clinics through the state website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. 
If you are unable to sign up online, you can call 855-722-7878. We can also make an appointment directly with, you can also make an appointment directly with um, Kenny Drugs, CVS Pharmacy, and Walgreens. All of these options are available at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Again, I've said this repeatedly, but I just wanna make sure that everybody hears this. Please cancel your appointment in the state system if you get a vaccine at a federal pharmacy program um, like CVS and, and Walgreens or Kenny Drugs. Thank you, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Well, anyone who's been listening to me over the past year should know by now that I generally tell it like I see it, but that I also have an optimistic outlook when I can in this pandemic. And today is no different. But I do need to make clear that my optimism is for the future. The future is very near, but when it comes to the present, Frankly, I am very concerned. Vermont is still seeing high numbers of daily cases, often reaching into the 200s lately. Now, higher numbers of people in the hospital, whereas within the last week we were back in the mid-20s. Today we are at 35, only two in the ICU, fortunately. Our positivity rate, of 2.2% is still quite low relative to other places, but it too is higher than we have been used to. We are seeing more community transmission, and those cases continue to appear in workplaces, schools, across all sectors of society, with all kinds of challenging ripple effects within those communities, and often with subsequent spread in households among loved ones. The bottom line is Vermont is no longer the one green state in a map of red COVID cases across the U.S. We are just like all the other states in our region, a region that is currently doing even worse than some other parts of the country with more disease circulating right now. Now a big part of why the virus is spreading more easily is certainly due to the variants, which have been detected in residents of five Vermont counties now. B117 in Chittenden, Franklin, Rutland, Caledonia, and Wyndham, and B149 in Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle. This information, by the way, is now available in a table on our COVID-19 website. An important point, though, sequencing is done only on select samples. So even if your county is not among those I just named, you should still assume that these more highly contagious variants are probably circulating in your areas as well. Our older populations, who we know are at higher risk of serious illness, now are largely protected by vaccine, which is great. This has been our goal. But many people aren't yet vaccinated, and they are still susceptible to the virus's spread. The good news is that vaccinated people have strong immunity to the variants we are seeing. And they may have a good response to variants we have not seen in the state and variants that we hope not to see, like those originally identified from South Africa and Brazil, though that is still under active investigation. But keep in mind, it's not just the variant strains that are responsible for what we are seeing. It is also our behaviors and the risks we either choose or not choose to assume at a time when these more transmissible variants are becoming the dominant strains. It's the choices we make every day and how we live our lives that will have some of the greatest impact on the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths we will see over the coming weeks. I know you're tired of the pandemic. We're all tired. And seeing these numbers go up can be demoralizing for us all. But here's my message. It is not too late we can still stop this rise in cases if we act now. 
we really only have about three more weeks before that future that I'm so optimistic for becomes the present. At that time, we project enough Vermonters will have been vaccinated so that we can live our lives with much lower risk of the virus easily finding its way from person to person. We're learning from the experience of countries like Israel and the United Kingdom, which found that reaching the 50% mark in portion of the population fully vaccinated can be a major milestone. Not the final milestone, but a clear turning point. This is a slide you may recall that's now been updated that shows how well we're doing with full vaccination in the oldest age bands that have had the most time to get fully vaccinated from 65 on to 75 plus. We're approaching 90% in many of those populations. In the more recently open bands, obviously we have a little ways to go, but just imagine where we will be in three weeks with these numbers of people ages 50 on up getting to that fully vaccinated uh, point in time really critical to understand and even more impressive to really see in context of the fact that the cases as you've heard from Commissioner Pichak in those older age bands have really dropped precipitously as have the other adverse outcomes like hospitalizations and deaths. Now you can help us get to that place. You could even be starting this weekend especially if you happen to be celebrating Easter and the other holidays that are being observed. I know you're eager to be with family or friends, but please know that with this much virus around, any gathering is riskier. Staying with your own household is still going to be safest. But if you do gather with people that you don't live with, try to keep it outside as much as possible, wear masks, even double mask if you want to, and keep the six-foot distance. For example, consider an outdoor Easter egg hunt instead of all eating in a closed space together. I know this is difficult, but again, we've been at it for over a year. We just need to hang tough for a few more weeks. Travel is still not advised by the CDC, though the director is now coming out talking about vaccinated people being able to more freely travel which seems like a very rational conclusion. If you do travel and are not vaccinated, including your children, make sure to quarantine afterward and certainly get tested, whether it's after travel, a possible exposure, a large gathering, or if you have symptoms of COVID. There are plenty of tests and testing locations near you. Getting a same day test is a piece of cake and the result will be turned around fast. All the information you need is on the website. Just like you're sick of the pandemic, you're probably sick of hearing all of the guidance we give as well. Same here, I wish I didn't have to say it anymore, but we do really need to hear it. No one wants to go backwards, despite all our hard work and sacrifices and painful losses, we don't wanna get back to the starting line again. Now, by far, most Vermonters are doing just what they need to, and I thank you all for that. A lot of people are asking me, what else can we do? Or even, why aren't we doing even more restricting? Well, in an era where we have more testing and contact tracing and containment, we don't need full lockdowns. We can be far more strategic. Isolated cases, or even an occasional outbreak in the schools does not mean closing schools is the answer. Isolated cases in a workplace or business does not mean closing all stores and restaurants. But we are aware of the inherent danger at this stage in our vaccination efforts of larger gatherings and travel. Do make the conscious effort to avoid crowded indoor spaces. So fellow Vermonters, please listen up Let's stop and think hard about the actions we take right now, gathering together and travel outside the guidance we provided may be hazardous right now. Look at that hospitalization data that you saw and the age distribution of cases. 
Though individual risk to a person under 50 does seem small compared with that for an older Vermonter before they could have been vaccinated, the more cases in an age range there are, the more likelihood somebody will have an adverse consequence. Hopefully not you. We are already seeing that start to happen. I would hate to see it progress further. Don't let the virus get the best of us. I also want to mention something I haven't mentioned in a while, a reminder about how this virus spreads so easily through the air that we all breathe. I'm making this point because especially when cases are up and the virus spreads in our communities, schools, teams, businesses, we need to work to stop any blaming, shaming, violating a person's privacy, and other negative behaviors toward people who test positive for COVID-19. With so much virus around, it really is harder to avoid it. Stigma hurts everyone by creating more fear or anger instead of focusing on the disease that is causing the problem. It can also make people more likely hide symptoms or illness and keep them from seeking health care immediately, which can lead to more opportunities for the virus to spread, a truly vicious cycle. And as more Vermonters may be needing to isolate and quarantine, it's critical we really support one another so we can keep each other safe. Blame the virus, not the victims. Finally, to end on another note with vaccine, some of you may have heard about the manufacturing error in one of Johnson & Johnson's plants. It was discovered it may have affected millions of doses. This was unfortunate news, but I want to reassure Vermonters who have gotten or may be scheduled to get the J&J vaccine that this problem did not affect any doses already shipped or administered. This was picked up as it should in a quality control process that worked. The vaccine remains safe and effective, and I'm heartened by the fact that the quality control tests did what they're designed to do and discovered this early. What this means is we can continue to be able to ensure all Vermonters are vaccinated as soon as they are eligible. And that day will come so soon, as the governor has emphasized. So when it is your turn, in addition to strictly following our prevention guidance, go to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine and make your appointment to get vaccinated. Together, we can bring this pandemic to an end all the sooner. Governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Well, now it open, open it up to questions. Um, thank you, Governor. So um, I guess given the, the rise in cases among young people and the manufacturing error that uh, Commissioner Levine mentioned with Johnson & Johnson, um, in, and you mentioned that we were supposed to uh, announce our, the blueprint for reopening today, uh, is, is this giving you pause or can, um, making you rethink you know, the pace of, of you know, our, our reopening? Yeah, well, again, uh, as I had said over the last month, uh, we are going to uh, roll out this detailed plan first week of April. Uh, and I'd said, I think, Tuesday uh, that I wasn't sure whether it was going to be uh, today or Tuesday. Um, I just think I just want to see what's going on, uh, making sure uh, that we're, uh, we're not missing something. But I don't believe we are. We expect it uh, to see more cases. Um, but I just want to make sure that they are at our expect, expected levels uh, and not escalating uh, beyond what we expected. So, so far we're not, and we're watching the data, you know, the hospitalizations, the deaths, everything looks as though it's staying uh, fairly stable. We did see, as Dr. Levine had said, a little bit of an uptake from even uh, uh, Wednesday to today of about five more in the hospital. So I just wanted to give a, a couple more days to make sure that we're solid on on the data and then we'll move forward. This plan 
will be a blueprint for the next three months. And it's going to rely on different benchmarks, milestones, and so forth. So I still f feel it's a viable plan and uh, will take us to the 4th of July when I, I truly believe uh, we'll be back to a much more normal um, summer uh, that we've experienced in the past. Given that we're seeing cases among uh, younger Vermonters now, um, you know, is, is that making you rethink uh, potentially, you know, getting or moving away from the age banding approach? I know there's been some calls uh, for, you know, uh, states open up vaccinations for younger Vermonters. So should, should we switch? Again, uh, just let's put this all in, into context here. Um, our strategy from the beginning has been hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, we're not seeing uh, an increase number, uh, concerning increase number of hospitalizations and deaths uh, in those younger age groups. In three weeks, three weeks, everyone's going to be able to sign up, 16 and over. Uh, so we're going to get there. If we decide to change our approach today, we wouldn't get there any sooner. So uh, for those other states, as I said, uh, when you look at uh, New Hampshire, for instance, uh, has decided to open up 16 and over, I believe that's because their, uh, their demand has diminished. Uh, their supply is, say, the same, you know, just like us, uh, but their demand has diminished. So uh, they wanted to open up to make sure that they were getting uh, shots and arms as quickly as possible. We, we don't, we're not experiencing that in Vermont. Uh, demand is still high. Uh, and if we get to people, if we get through the age band uh, in a uh, quicker fashion, you know, if, they're, if demand does diminish here in Vermont, we'll just move up uh, and uh, get people vaccinated all that much quicker. So the approach we've taken has served us well uh, and we'll see it through and I believe that in the end will uh, be uh, shown as one that got to those the quickest and we'll still be able to uh, to be able to tell a good story about the number of deaths and hospitalizations in Vermont. One last question, I'm sorry, Governor, but um, the, as you may have seen this morning, uh, House Speaker Jill Trawinski announced that they're going to be temporarily shelving the, uh, the pension plan uh, for, for state employees and uh, teachers. Um, Instead, you know, just, just this session moving along with the governance proposals. Um, but she said that, you know, this summer, uh, they need you at the table. They, they need your, your opinion and your, what you'll be uh, willing to accept. Um, I guess, how, how do you, with, with uh, that plan off the table now, how, how do you envision, you know, these discussions going this summer? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I didn't realize uh, she was having a a press conference this morning, so I was just updated, briefed uh, before I came down, so I don't have all the specifics. Um, but uh, from my perspective, I'm disappointed, obviously. Uh, this is a huge problem for our state. It's going to affect everyone uh, in years to come. It's a $5.7 billion unfunded liability that has to be uh, dealt with um, because uh, uh, if we don't, uh, it's going to be we're going to be facing insolvency, and that's something that we can't let happen. Uh, in terms of uh, being at the table, uh, I've been at the table for the last four years. Uh, I've I've talked about this publicly. I've talked about it with the, uh, the leadership in the in the House and the Senate. Um, I'm a willing partner. I'm I'll be at the table. I don't want to be the main course, but I'll be at the table. Uh, this is their moment uh, to shine. Uh, this is uh, their responsibility as a majority party to get something done. Something I advocate for um, is probably not going to be accepted uh, first out of, out of hand. So it's going to take them to lead. But I'm willing, and I've given them great credit for bringing this up, Treasurer Pierce, the legislative leadership, um, and that's what it's going to take. They have to lead on this. They're the majority party. They're in control of the legislature. Um, but, uh, but I am there to give them ideas, uh, my perspective, and uh, be able to, uh, to solve this uh, uh, in the future. Um, so while I'm disappointed, I'm encouraged to hear uh, they are still willing to have the discussion because it has to be dealt with. And as someone who um, knows better than most what it's like uh, to take up a controversial issue uh, that is um, that when it upsets your own base uh, and your own supporters, I appreciate uh, what they've been going through. Um, but this is the time to 
have some courage and stand up and do what you know is right uh, for our state. Steve? Uh, Governor, given the, um, the situation with uh, the, the response uh, to vaccination here in Vermont, um, does it surprise you that the Democrats, uh, the Democratic uh, uh, spokesman put out a, a press, uh, press release yesterday that uh, said uh, was highly critical of uh, you and the administration's um, take on uh, how to distribute the vaccine? Um, I didn't see, I didn't see the statement. Uh, I guess it doesn't surprise me that uh, the Democratic Party sent out something that was critical of me. I think I'm quite accustomed to that at this point. Um, but, um, you know, we, uh, I don't do things in a vacuum. We have a great team uh, of advisors, uh, health experts, uh, and, uh, and everyone working together uh, to do what we think is right for Vermont. Uh, and when we're wrong, if we think we should be taking a different approach, we do so. Uh, it's not based on ego. So. Uh, I'm quite confident uh, that what we're doing is the right approach based on the hospitalizations and deaths and the data and the science. And, uh, and again, just to remind everyone, you know, three more weeks, less than three weeks, uh, we'll be opening up to all uh, Vermonters 16 and over. So um, this is just, uh, just one more month. Just hold on and, uh, and do things right. Follow the guidance. and and uh, make sure that we're protecting others. And we'll get through this, and we'll, uh, we'll have, again, a good story to tell uh, after this is over, I believe. But, um, uh, but we're on this course. I think it's the most efficient and effective way of, uh, of vaccinating the population of Vermont, and we'll continue in this regard. Are you worried at all that uh, with that message getting out, and if, uh, if does it truly reflect what uh, what you're seeing from uh, members of the opposing party and and uh, are you worried that perhaps it sends the wrong message as you're trying to get this thing done well I, I still think that the vast majority of Vermonters at, at this point in time um, still have an interest in getting vaccinated I think that's what we're seeing that's what we're hearing uh, and uh, even what the uh, um, opposition party is uh, is is saying um, so that's good news. I mean, we want there to be demand, and we just need the supply to go along with it. So we're dealing with, you know, a, a finite amount of vaccine coming into the state, and we're distributing it in a way that we think is the most efficient and the most effective. And we'll continue to do so, regardless of politics. Uh, we just want to do what's right. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, Dr. Kelso, entire uh, team that we've had working on this, feels this is the right approach, and this has nothing, nothing to do with party or partisanship. Are you worried that politics are being used? I mean, I, I'm not surprised that politics are being used, but, uh, but no, I think, uh, I think uh, we'll see, uh, hopefully, the demand. I, I am concerned about uh, the youth, uh, the younger, the age group. I think that we're seeing that throughout the country, and that's why other states have had to open up to a broader group because they're not seeing the demand, the uptake, uh, especially on, amongst uh, the younger population. So uh, I want to encourage everyone, when it's your turn, sign up, uh, because uh, this is, uh, again, a way to protect yourself, protect your family, and uh, gives you more mobility. And so we'll get back to normal that much quicker. Governor, if I could follow up on Calvin's question, uh, in which you expressed disappointment in the Democratic leadership decision to delay uh, another year anyway, uh, would you still support or would you support a significant one-time pay down um, uh, or pay in for the pension fund this year? Uh, not without structural changes, Stuart, no. Uh, okay. The House yesterday approved a, a charter change requested by the voters of Winooski to um, allow those not yet U.S. citizens to vote in local Winooski elections. Do um, you have a problem with that? Uh, is this, again, was this the committee that approved it? No, this is the House. The House. I hadn't, hadn't been following that, uh, to be honest with you. 
Uh, yeah, I have some concerns. Okay. I have some concerns with it, um, but uh, we'll see how it goes through the legislative process. Finally, um, a viewer asked, she's got some adult kids, and she asked whether you would consider drive-through vaccine clinics. Uh, she said her young adult children are hesitant uh, to go into indoor vac sites because of the uptick, and they don't want to wait inside somewhere for 45 minutes. Uh, what do you think about drive-through vaccine clinics? Well, we've been contemplating that. Uh, at this point in time, we haven't needed them um, because we're, we're keeping up, so to speak. But... Uh, We'll be looking at different approaches because we want uh, there to be more demand. We want to make it as easy as possible. So that could be part of our strategy uh, in the weeks to come. But uh, but right now we're going to continue with the vaccination sites that we have. But but it could be it could happen. Thanks a lot. Wilson, uh, hi everybody. Um, Follow up to the uh, to, to this jump in cases. Uh, you you say how there's not much that could be done in the next three weeks before everyone is eligible, but it seems like a lot of transmission could take place in the next three weeks. Is there anything that can be done, and are you considering anything um, for those younger age groups? I don't know what it could be, but the ones where the spread seems to be happening the most. Um, well, again. Following the health guidance uh, would be very helpful. Uh, I'm not saying that that's uh, causing this, um, but uh, but it is suspicious in some respects. So we just need to continue to do what we've been doing well over the last uh, 12 to 14 months, uh, when we didn't have you know there was a period of time when we didn't have any vaccine uh, available, and we were able to mitigate and contain. So um, so we need to just do what we've done in the past. I know that there's a lot of uh, COVID fatigue. Uh, I know, you know, each and every one of us feels it in some way and want this to be over. Um, but I, I think about this uh, in terms of racing. You know, I, I, um, I've been involved in racing my entire life thus far, been in some long races. And when there's 10 to go, and if I'm doing fairly well or leading the race, um, and there's a, there's a caution, I don't, uh, I don't take those caution laps and take off my helmet and uh, release my uh, my uh, five point harness. I uh, I buckle up. Uh, I actually uh, get back into control. I pay attention, and focus on the last ten laps, and that's where I feel like we are right now. I mean, as tired as you are, and as tired of, as you are of of going through this and all the restrictions and everything that comes along with it, now is not the time to let up. Now's the time to really, you know, buckle in and uh, and make sure you pay attention, hit your marks, and uh, and lead the race. So um, I feel the same way here. But doesn't it seem that people are taking off their five-point harnesses and taking a breath? Yeah. And, and it's not they're, they're not keeping their what what I don't know. Follow your metaphor. I don't know, but uh, you know, is there more that can be done than just uh, urging them to do it? Um, may ask Dr. Levine, uh, you know, I, I just am trying to encourage uh, people to do the right thing and to remember what we've done so well over the last 14 months. So, Dr. Levine. Certainly, the, the age range we're talking about is regarded by most as much more socially active, if you will. So one can be socially active in some ways that are not going to be conducive to spreading the virus and in other ways that could be conducive in increasing the transmission of the virus. And so it all really, again, comes down to gatherings and avoiding uh, the sizable gatherings and avoiding those gatherings in the indoor locations. So that is sort of one thing to focus on. And even within our um, executive order gathering guidelines, those are pretty well laid out in safe ways as opposed to uh, getting carried away with the concept of a gathering. The other part is, and I, I don't say this to be an alarmist, but uh, so many people for so long have been emphasizing the benign nature of having COVID. And if your friends 
only got a headache uh, and somebody else tested positive but had no symptoms, it's easy to sort of look at that and go, whatever. Uh, if I get it, I get it. It's not a problem. But the reality is, you know, we know from a health standpoint it can be a significant problem. And it doesn't mean it will affect a large percentage of people in that age group in a bad way, but there are going to be some that are not going to do as well. They're going to possibly be hospitalized, because we've seen that. They're going to possibly get a uh, sequela that could be the long haul type syndrome. Um, or they might just get ill during the time they have it, worse than the worst flu that they've ever had. So we shouldn't just assume that it's a benign condition for everyone. And I, I think that needs to be emphasized um, more broadly. Um, others are saying, and the governors, I think, covered this pretty well today, that we'll just start vaccinating them now and that will take care of everything. Uh, but the reality is, you know, that kind of immediate vaccination is not a strategy to uh, suddenly stem what's going on. It, it doesn't work that way, and the vaccine won't be effective quickly enough to make it work that way. It's really uh, hanging in there with the behaviors um, and just becoming, again, conscious you're in those last few laps and we need to uh, do as much as we can. Hi, um, thanks. I'm going to continue, <clears throat> excuse me, what Wilson was asking and ask Dr. Levine, have you seen evidence that the young are behaving any differently now that they are letting up their guard? That they're behaving any differently that they're what? Letting up their guard and being less cautious about uh, gathering and following the guidelines. I mean, I'm just wondering if you've seen uh, you've, you've laid out what people should be doing to mm -hmm. prevent the spread, and we've talked about how it's really happening with the 18 to 24 year olds. I mean, is there any evidence that they really are acting differently? Uh, I, I would hate to use they as the entire population of that age group. So yes, in in some instances, absolutely, but I don't want to stereotype them in that way because there are plenty that are acting responsibly. Um, you know, certainly, if you're going to just talk 18, I would, I would spread it to 18 to 30, because that covers a lot of population. And some of those are college students. Some of those are young adults who are out of college or never went to college, but are in the workforce either way. And um, it's a socially more active time of life for all of them. So um, it's not like they're all misbehaving, and I don't want to let that impression um, go too far. But clearly, we do have evidence that not everyone is perfect, uh, just like throughout the pandemic, that's been true. So, you know, if we look at the college population specifically, you know, the colleges have been doing a really great job with um, not only providing the appropriate guidance and limitations, trying to provide alternates uh, in terms of activities for students, opportunities for them to be uh, more socially active but outdoors in more controlled circumstances. And they've been very uh, strict with uh, sanctions processes. Most of us don't live on a college campus. Uh, and even if we're in the 18 to 30 demographic, we don't live in a college campus. So we're not subject to all of that structure and those um, regulations, if you will. So it's really everyone has to pitch in, no matter where you are located in that age range, uh, knowing that because this is a so much more transmissible uh, strain of virus and because you are going to be in circumstances more often socially than perhaps other age groups that just need to be extra careful. Uh, and use the data to guide yourself. The data in your own age demographic tells you a lot. Uh, and should, should actually encourage you to be more careful knowing uh, what the caseloads are uh, by age by age. Thank you. I guess the object of the question is that I, I don't really see a clear reason why Vermont's positivity rate is so high, um, given that you know so many people are vaccinated now. Um, it's just 
kind of surprising that Vermont's positivity rate is so high right now. And I'm wondering if you guys can see any clear reasons. Well, I, I guess I, I would start with the thesis that the positivity rate is so high. It's, it's the highest it's been in a long, long time, which is 2.2 percent, which um, I haven't looked at all 50 states to see if we're still one of the top or one of the bottom three states with regard to positivity rate, but I suspect we are. Um, states that are even close to us in southern New England are getting their positivity rates up in the high single digits. And there are reports from Michigan, uh, the positivity rates are in the 30 plus percent range. So, so we're doing very well with our positivity rate still, but it's, a, it's a, um, a, a metric we follow very closely. And we don't like the fact it's going up, even though it hasn't gone up to an astronomical level at this point. Right, and I was wondering if you can think of any reasons why this is happening. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's specifically tied in with the fact that there's more virus out there infecting more people. Um, and we feel very comfortable yeah. knowing that because we're testing adequately so that that positivity rate probably reflects uh, reality as much as uh, it can. Because unlike in other parts of the country where they're reporting less uptake of testing, we're actually still having pretty exuberant testing with the surveillance populations like colleges and schools and without those. We're having uh, enough people step up to the plate, so to speak. So we feel that 2.2% does reflect reality. All right, um, thanks. So my other question is also about vaccines. Are the Johnson & Johnson errors, are they gonna affect Vermont at all over the next few weeks? I know we were expecting a lot of vaccines from Johnson & Johnson. It's not going to affect our doses at all. It was never factored into the uh, numbers that the governor received uh, on Tuesday regarding this next week's allotment. So that's all coming. All right, we got to move to um, Hi, uh, my first question is for the governor. Um, earlier this year during your budget address, you had mentioned $1 million that would go toward an infrastructure project in Highgate. There's been a lot of discussion at the local level about that. Is that funding still on the table? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it is. I, you know, this is, um, we had had it in the budget and uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the house has done with that, to be honest with you. And we'll, um, We'll have to see. I mean, it's it's in the legislature at this point. All right, and I'm not sure um, who this next question would be best for, but uh, is there any guidance in place for going coming down the pike about um, reopening of the state courthouses? Well, they're they're an independent branch. Uh, obviously, when we put out our guidance, our blueprint, um, they will be have to react to that. Um, so I think it will be up to them. So it's probably more of a judiciary question than anything else. Okay, so there isn't any, but there isn't any guidance in place from the health department perspective of um, sort of the safest way to do that. I am not aware uh, of anything specific to the courts, but um, uh, yeah, I, again, I don't know if anyone, uh, Secretary Curley or others, have any information on this or not. Um, Governor? Governor uh, oh, go ahead, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> this is Secretary Young. Thank you. I do know that the um, judiciary has been working to uh, reopen um, some courthouses for jury trials, and they did have some uh, jury trials scheduled, I believe, in Wyndham County last week, um, but those apparently all settled. So they have uh, been working with their own expert and, and closely with BGS that maintains those buildings um, to create a safe environment for jury trials. 
Uh, I, it's unclear to me whether they've actually held one yet, but they are working towards um, reopening some of their courthouses in order to do so. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, questions for Secretary Smith about the mobile clinics he, um, he mentioned coming to Essex County. Um, what vaccine variety is being administered and how many doses uh, will be available, um, I guess, total over those two days? Yeah, Andrew, I don't know the vaccine. Uh, we'll get back to you on the vaccine uh, distribution on that. It's about 300, I think, doses over those two days uh, that will be in that will be at the mobile clinics. Um, I think we're looking uh, over a course of uh, some time through the uh, through the healthcare facility um, of about a thousand. Uh, doses at at some point, and that's that would be in Colebrook is what we're looking at. Oh, this is the uh, partner in New Hampshire that you referenced. That's right. Okay, uh, and you you also mentioned that there would be some limited capacity for walk-ins, although obviously you you encourage people to sign up. What what does that walk-in capacity look like, it? and is that at, at all of the mobile spots you'll be making, or just at the end of the day? Or? No, it'll be in all the mobile spots, but it's going to be very limited. I don't have a number for you. I would encourage people not well, to rely on that, uh, because there's only going to be a limited amount in, in terms of walk-ins, but we, we wanted to make sure that if we had one or, or a few walk-ins that we could accommodate that. And if this is successful, uh, do you have any anticipation of uh, future mobile clinics when the final age bracket opens up, or are you going to rely on that um, partnership over in New Hampshire? I think it's it, I think it's going to be twofold, and I, I really do. I, you know, we've as you know, we've been concerned about Essex County in terms of its uptake rate, and we are um, looking at it all the time. So we'll continue to look at uh, at. Essex County as it's compared to other counties and if we need other interventions we'll do it and we'll see how this this mobile um, this mobile these mobile units work uh, in that county and uh, lastly are you uh, restricting these appointments to only Essex County residents in any way or are you just counting on <laughs> on distance and proximity to do that all on its own I, I think distance and proximity will, will be our, our key here. I understand. Thank you. All right, just a reminder to everyone hoping that everyone in the queue can stick to two or three questions so the folks at the end don't get shortchanged as they have been the last few days. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, reference the uh, state pension problem. Uh, I mean, it was well known by both the state and the, the labor unions themselves that the state pension plan has been continuously underfunded. Everybody was kicking the can down the road as far as paying the piper. Do uh, you see a similar parallel with all the money that Washington is passing out to every town and city and county and state and every school in the 50 states with no real serious plan? pay for all this free money they're just kicking the can down the road again i mean is this yeah. good government kicking the can down the road all the time for children and grandchildren to pay the piper well again nothing's free um somebody has to pay at some point and we know that there will be a bill or an invoice due um i think some of what we've seen um obviously uh, this uh, some of the packages that we've uh, been able to cares packet a package and and ARPA uh, will have a beneficial impact on Vermont uh, to work our way out of this pandemic and get back to normalcy. Um, but, uh, but I think it is, uh, uh, I, I think that both sides of the aisle need to be at the table on the, on the federal level and uh, try and determine, you know, how are we going to pay for whatever we need? I think the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure package in particular is something that's uh, important to our country. We've seen uh, the dilapidated roads and bridges and so forth, uh, water systems and, and the like uh, that, uh, that have gone um, beyond their life expectancy. So uh, 
trying to focus money on that, I think, is, uh, is prudent. But we uh, also have to have the conversation on both sides of the aisle. It shouldn't be a partisan issue uh, about how we pay for it. But obviously it needs to be paid. Um, I've, I've heard a couple of different numbers. I'm wondering what you've heard as to what the annual cost would be of doing nothing this year and just, again, kicking the pension uh, can down the road. Yeah. For another year, it's uh, I don't have the number, uh, but it's you know it's hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that we uh, will will have to be paid, uh, and uh, and that just keeps increasing as time goes on. So that's the point we're at now. I mean, obviously we can we've already budgeted uh, the amount of money for fiscal year uh, 22, uh, but uh, but again, this just keeps uh, growing, and uh, and and it's going to get to a point where we're just plane not going to have the money to do so to uh, um, to um, backfill uh, this uh, this hole that we find ourselves in but does somebody have the number of of doing nothing so that if uh, yes April I'm, 2nd of next year we you and I were talking uh, we would know how much uh, more was tagged on to this bill yeah, I'm. I'm sure we have the money or the uh, the details. It's probably Secretary Young uh, can get with you on that, or she can point someone in your direction and uh, get that to you if that if that works. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just wondering what the taxpayers what they'd have to to fund. Great. Thank you very much. That'll be my question. Thank you. Cat WCAS. Hi, uh, the Johnson Johnson shot is now being given out more broadly than just teachers. And I know a few people were kind of taken by surprise when they got it because the messaging here at the briefings was that that vaccine was being set aside for teachers. If there are folks out there who for medical reasons want or don't want that shot, how can they make sure that they know? Because right now it seems like people, when they're being signed up, they don't find out until after they've made the appointment, which shot they might have. And even then it only says single dose, you know, so they, it doesn't directly say on there, yes, this is Johnson & Johnson, although you could do some math in your head on the fact that we only have one. But I know you said your goal is for people to be able to choose the shot, so how close are we to making that happen? I think we're, we're very close as we uh, get a consistent supply of Johnson & Johnson. Um, I think that we do make it known uh, as to who is receiving it. Um, but I'm gonna ask Secretary Smith to comment on this. Kat, that's a very good question. We are going to put onto the re registration site, if we haven't already, and I, I'm just not sure yet, uh, but we are going to put on the registration site whether a vaccination site is one dose or two dose. Okay, and for those, if people say, I really don't want a specific shot, are they gonna have multiple options, you think, within their community to find a site that works for them? Yeah, I mean, there may be, you know, within their community is going to be like 30 minutes, but there may be, it, you may have to hunt a little bit. I mean, our farm, our federal pharmacy partners are getting Johnson & Johnson as well. Um, we're getting Johnson & Johnson. We're, I, it's limited, but we're getting Johnson & Johnson as we, uh, as we move forward. We've opened up Johnson & Johnson to uh, community vaccination sites, I think, last week. Um, which is this, because we start on a Tuesday, I, um, which is this week, um, we had about 5,000 that were in, for teachers, um, 1As, and community uh, vaccination sites. So um, we have started opening up uh, those Johnson & Johnson to, uh, to more venues than just teachers. Great, thanks. Last question here is a quick one for Dr. Levine. Um, it looks like the numbers for cases for March 31st were revised up to 263, which I believe would be a new record for us. With this jump in cases, is it because young people might be more likely to be asymptomatic and just not know they have it? Do you think that accounts for any of this increased spread and rising cases? So setting records is not something we're really interested in right now, but um, when you see a jump like that in the count, uh, it's an update 
because of the fact that there are so many tests being done right now that some of those tests aren't coming back as timely and they come back after hours, but they still count for the day that they came back on. So we accurately as, uh, attribute them to the appropriate day. But nonetheless, it's still a larger number of tests. And yes, there are more people that uh, will be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic in the, in the younger age groups, for sure. Um, uh, though certainly people in their middle ages are not immune from being potentially asymptomatic as well. Uh, but we are going to see, uh, at a time of higher viral transmission, more asymptomatic individuals who uh, are tested and uh, may only have been a contact, but then find out they are positive. Thank you. We'll try Greg, the county courier. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, let's start with a quick follow-up here. Um, have anyone, uh, have any towns reached out to VTRAM for help with mud season? And are you still under the impression that it's, the, uh, it's, it's a typical year? I think it is, uh, first of all, I think it is a typical year uh, for mud season in Vermont um, when you look back historically. Um, in some parts of Vermont, it might be more extreme than others, as is typical of a mud season in Vermont as well. Uh, some areas uh, aren't as impacted. Um, I did check in with the um, Secretary of Transportation on Wednesday, I believe, and uh, at that point, uh, no one had reached out, um, but they had proactively reached out to Montgomery. I think that might be uh, where you had heard from. And uh, they've had some problems, but they said that they didn't uh, need our assistance at this point, but appreciated the call. Thank you. Uh, and my other follow-up here, I, and that, I think it's going to be it for today, uh, I did get a call back from someone at Health and Human Services about the question I brought up pertaining to kind of some inconsistent numbers on the vaccination rate, vaccination data. Um, I'm told that the reason the state initially showed a vaccination rate of 102% uh, for the 75 plus age group in Grand Isle was because the state is using estimated 2019 census data. Um, additionally, I'm told that the reason that the state is now only reporting 95% is to protect patient uh, confidentiality for, for people who become vaccinated. And I'm, I'm wondering why 5%, why 95% is that threshold? Because if that's going to be used throughout the entire state, that means that for uh, the 18 to 29-year-old age group in Chittenden County, for instance, it could be a murky enough number to not even be able to narrow it down within 5,500 people. Um, in the past, the state has been using a threshold of six patients for town-by-town -town COVID number. And so uh, 5,500 people in Chittenden County is literally 900 times less accurate. I I'm wondering uh, who's making these policies, if it's somebody high up in the administration or if it's if somebody in a back room somewhere trying to you know, do their best and, and not thinking through everything. Um, and, and why is six not a valid enough number anymore? And, and we got to go with a percent, uh, especially since the, the number we're working off of, the, the estimated uh, census data is already murky enough. It's, it's not going to 
give any member of the general public enough information to say so-and-so did or didn't get their vaccine. Yeah, you've lost me. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Levine. <laughs> Governor, he's lost me too, but I will do what I can do here. Um, and, and certainly uh, dispel any um, uh, transparency questions, conspiracy issues, uh, things happening at either high levels of government or in back rooms uh, with uh, some bureaucrat or what have you. Uh, but the bottom line is, in some of our counties, the populations within a specific age brand or sex are very small. And if you use a higher percentage than 95 percent, it leaves very few people in the unvaccinated category and means that the risk of re-identification based on vaccination status will be higher than very small. Some of this is inconsistency, not inconsistent, inconsistency with uh, HIPAA and its guidelines. A lot of it is in the statistician world uh, using uh, knowledge of statistics and how that behaves when referring to population data. Others of it is in the uh, epidemiologic world uh, with standards, standardization of reporting across uh, all states and all uh, municipalities. So it, it's a very complicated topic, to be honest, uh, but the goal that's in mind is always to protect uh, the ability to not identify uh, individuals, uh, especially in states like ours that tend to be rural, have pockets of people where their uh, population is much smaller, and um, these issues can actually become real for those people living there. That with regard to the numbers of six and 25 and what have you, um, I, I would not be able to do that topic justice uh, here at the podium because it is quite complex and it's actually been honed over a number of years of experience. Um, never came to the forefront before we had a pandemic, but actually we're not departing from anything that has been more conventional over time. I hope well, I've but, done but some justice to your like, question. It, it wasn't like this initially. Initially, the state was actually publishing the, the actual information. That's why we were, you know, even though it was on a on a estimated basis, we got to 102 percent, and it just seems odd that the state would uh, publish a number that, like I said, in some age groups could be murky enough to only narrow it down to, to 5,500 people, um, and and not even put a greater than sign before the 95 percent, just listing it as 95 percent and hoping that people, you know, read all the way through the multi-pages of notes on the website to, to be able to see that once you get to 95 percent, it may actually be more than that. It, it seems a little short-sighted at best, if, if not a bit deceptive. So that's why I was trying to get down to a little bit more than that. I understand. Just uh, publicly, I'll say nothing nefarious going on here. Uh, if you want to submit uh, your questions with, with much more specificity to me, again, I will actually work with our branch that handles all of health data and try to get you an answer that is uh, comprehensible. Okay, I will do that. I appreciate that. And, thank you. Uh, I think that's it for me. Uh, Governor, I think there are a few people from Montgomery that would uh, love to have you up to see their road. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Aaron. Um, I, uh, I have a question about this blueprint. I know that you may not be able to discuss it in detail, um, but one thing that I wanted to mention is that last year, last spring, when the state was reopening, you guys created these benchmarks to kind of demonstrate that it was safe to reopen. And, you know, that included percent positivity, the case growth rate, um, ICU capacity, uh, and syndromic surveillance. And, and eventually testing as well. Um, you know, some of those some of those might still be applicable. Some of them might kind of have a different impression when you know the 
most vulnerable Vermonters in the state um, are vaccinated. So, you know, are you thinking more along the lines of kind of using those benchmarks to guide reopening decisions? And or, or are you going to revise them with kind of this new normal in mind? Or is it kind of going to be just based on the vaccination progress, you know, proceeding at a regular date? Um, you know, as we reach more, you know, the, the state opening up in different eligibility categories. Yeah, our, our strategy always continues to remain the same, protect the most vulnerable, uh, reduce the number of hospitalizations and deaths. Um, but the game has changed, uh, admittedly. Uh, we didn't have, back in March, uh, a year ago, we didn't have the vaccine available to us. Um, and now we do. We've seen uh, the beneficial effects of that in our data. I mean, it just shows clearly um, because we've used the age banding approach uh, that we've been able to reduce the number of deaths, uh, the number of hospitalizations in that population 65 and over. Um, so uh, I, I, without going into further detail, uh, you can expect that uh, vaccinations will play a role in this blueprint. Okay, so let's say, you know, just hypothetically speaking, you know, the percent positivity benchmark that's been touted by the state is 5%. Obviously, we're still far away from that. But, you know, if the state were to hit above a 5% positivity rate but remain low in, you know, cases among the most vulnerable populations, you know, would you still consider ending the reopening process or, or would that have an effect on your Any, decision making? Yeah, anything we do, uh, whether it's uh, the dates we, we put forth in terms of uh, the vaccinations and when, a, when an age band opens up or anything of that nature, anything we do, uh, we reserve the right to utilize some common sense and, and reserve the right uh, to reflect on the data and what we're seeing on the ground. So this is a blueprint. This is a plan, uh, and uh, and I believe that it's a solid plan, and that uh, if we adhere to it, uh, we'll be much back. Uh, we'll be back to normal by the fourth of July. But again, we'll uh, reserve the right to change course if needed to protect Vermonters. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about young people and the variants. Um, Oh, sorry. Did Dr. Levine have any comments on that first question? Okay. Just double checking. Um, I'll let Dr. Levine answer something. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I think the, the one line the governor said that's most important is the game has changed. And I just invite you to look at the state of California. It was a few months ago, they were debating if they should let an ambulance park at the hospital and discharge the patient to the emergency room and get into the ICU because they were completely out of capacity. Ambulances would literally be driving around the city of Los Angeles. Their surge occurred too soon for vaccine to play a big role in any of the decision making they could make. I don't want to say we're fortunate now, but one thing that's true of this time is we're having a surge at a time when the most vulnerable are vaccinated already, which is fantastic. We're not seeing them dying. We're not seeing them get hospitalized. We may see hospitalizations bump up a little, but I would seriously doubt that we'll see any challenge to the capacity of our healthcare system right now uh, with predominantly younger people becoming infected. Uh, so it's, a, it's all about timing in some regards as well. So everything the governor said is true, that we can use all of our metrics that we use every day, but we have to use them uh, understanding that a new metric has entered the game. And the new metric is how fast and how efficiently are we vaccinating and what size population are we getting to uh, take the vaccine? So all of that has to be factored in at the same time. And even if one of the older metrics starts to look less good than we're accustomed to it looking, it doesn't mean it's the game changer uh, anymore because we have vaccine and we know that that will have an eventual influence on that metric 
over a shorter period of time. You had another okay, question, thank though? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think this might be a quick one. Um, you know, with our understanding of the variant, you know, kind of changing as we go along. Uh, but I do know that one recommendation that has kind of arisen with concerns to the variant is double masking. And I was curious, you know, how much do we understand about young people uh, following double masking guidance or even being aware that it's a requirement? Because obviously people are very much used to the uh, recommendations for the old strain of the, the virus. Yeah, so don't have a good handle on uh, what percentage of our younger people are actually using double masks or using some of the new tucking in mechanisms for the masks. Keep in mind, um, that is a uh, recent piece of data that the CDC has put on its website from experiments, not from actually experience with people. But the experiments are pretty compelling showing that the amount of leakage on the side of the mask is really markedly reduced when you adopt one of these newer strategies. So at a time when we have a virus that seems even more transmissible, it really does seem like the prudent thing we should do and probably shouldn't wait for some study to come out three months from now. Uh, this is one of those that isn't such a major inconvenience to someone that they could actually do on their own pretty easily. Um, I don't have a good uh, handle on, though, uh, what the uptake of that has been on any age population in Vermont at this point, except just personally um, observing um, and noticing, because people actually make a point of saying, see, I'm double masked. And I'm like, okay, sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. Are, are there any other recommendations that we should be following now uh, relative to the variant? Just double checking. Yeah, no, I, we, we're, there's really no super new guidance except to really pay attention, as I said in my opening comments, to the issues of crowds, indoor spaces, and travel. Okay, thank you. Sorry, there's 12.40. We have eight left in the queue. Actually, nine. There's somebody who got skipped earlier. Uh, so please, again, two to three questions. Joe, Barton Chronicle. Thank you. Uh, last uh, briefing, Secretary Smith um, briefly mentioned that um, hospitals uh, both um, for inpatient and outpatient uh, visitors, and I'm talking about, I guess, people seeking treatment, uh, are now to ask to see proof of vaccination. I received a message from a reader who is very concerned about um, the purpose of this. Um, the reader, either for medical reasons or personal reasons, isn't vaccinated and is concerned that the, uh, the purpose of looking for proof of vaccination is to deny people coverage. Uh, if they are not vaccinated. Joe, the purpose of, of this was, you gotta remember, we, ha we, ha we have had in place very strict uh, visitation policies in uh, hospitals. And what we were trying to do is um, to loosen those up a little bit. I mean. We, we talked about isolation in senior centers. We talked about isolation in long-term care facilities. You, you can actually have some sort of isolation in as an inpatient or um, you know in a, in a hospital. So what we were trying to do is loosen it up. The way we felt comfortable about loosening up some of these restrictions to come in and visit somebody into the hospital was your vaccination status. Now we do have certain exemptions that have been in place for quite a while, but they're pretty strict in terms of your visitation. All we were trying to do was give the patient uh, some relief uh, for visitors coming into the facility and vaccination seemed to be the logical choice in terms of using some sort of criteria. So just to be clear, um, 
the person, a person coming to the hospital seeking treatment, um, would not be no. restricted in any way because they didn't have a card showing they had been that, vaccinated. Yeah, that that is absolutely right. Okay, that's all this person wanted to know. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, um, Secretary press conference talked about um, making sure that you cancel your appointment at a state clinic if you get one at the pharmacy. Is the state tracking um, if, if people are not doing that? And do we know, are we losing vaccines? How has that been going as more vaccines have been rolling out? Secretary Smith. Yeah, we, there may, Howard, there may be a, a, an instance or, or a few where that happens. I'm just making sure that it doesn't happen. Uh, but we've had very few sort of, very few or no, well, very few wasted doses. Um, so I don't, I don't see that as an issue. I'm just trying to make sure that we avoid any issues as we uh, move forward, because you gotta remember, we're opening in three weeks. This is gonna be everybody, and I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that um, you know, we wanna make sure there's slots available. But uh, we have not seen um, a high percentage of wasted doses. Uh, we have seen, and I've mentioned it at a couple of times, where you know, a, some have been dropped and, and wasted. Uh, but not from, and we've seen where some peop, some institutions didn't have proper procedures in place to um, handle sort of doses at the end of the day. All that's been corrected, uh, but you know it's a highly intensive uh, human endeavor that we're doing in terms of the vaccination. There are going to be um, instances where there are sort of dropped vials or something like that, but. In terms of uh, not, uh, you know, not showing up and that that dose being wasted, I haven't seen it because of that. Okay. Um, one question, maybe for Secretary French. Massachusetts today recommended that schools not hold proms this year. Um, are we going to be hearing anything about proms uh, soon? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, we will be issuing uh, some guidance and direction for end of year activities uh, in April, but uh, not at this moment. And proms will be included in that? Yeah, we'll address all kinds of end of year activities, including proms. Okay, great. That's it for me. Thanks. Well, this is Dr. Levine. I just wanted to add data from the last week in March shows that our wastage rate actually dropped from 0.2% to one-tenth of one percent. Um, so even in this concern about appointments being canceled and what have you, our wastage rate is actually diminishing. Kim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, just to be clear on Stewart's question on the pensions, you would veto a pension plan that was only one-time money? No. That wasn't, uh, I don't believe that was the question, and maybe I misunderstood. I think um, what Stewart's, Stewart's question was whether I would support using one-time money right now, this $150 million that they have reserved, without um, having a plan, uh, moving forward with that this year, and, uh, and then moving on to the structural issues next year. I believe that was the question, and my response is I would not support that. Uh, I think they have to be tied together. Yeah, that, that was basically what I, what I was wondering, yeah. Just wanted to clarify that. Also, if Commissioner Harrington is, is on board today, I noticed that the weekly unemployment claims doubled, uh, and they doubled and they went up more than they have in several months, and I was wondering if there was a reason why, if you knew if there was a reason why. Uh, when you're talking about weekly claims, I believe you're talking about initial claims or new claims. Um, yeah, exactly. In, so in that number um, are also individuals who have, whose 
prior benefit year has exhausted and now okay. are uh, re reapplying for a new benefit year. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's a uh, a new individual completely. It could be somebody who had filed last March uh, for benefits and came up on their one year anniversary and resubmitted an application for a new benefit year. So it's just a sort of a technical uh, issue there more than anything else. Yeah, it's a it's a program requirement uh, that individuals must reapply every 12 months and that uh, we must redetermine their eligibility based on prior wages and, and various compliance uh, within the program. So um, it's a standard course that it happens every year regardless of whether we're in a pandemic or not. Just so happens that the population obviously is much larger. Um, we still are continuing to see um, a certain number of claims each week that are um, are also fraudulent and identified as suspected fraud. Um, and it's usually somewhere between 25 uh, and 35 percent of uh, initial claims uh, that are are suspected of fraud. But the the large increase. Um, is directly related to the number of people uh, opening new um, new benefit years um, because they reached their one year anniversary. All right, great, thanks, Michael. Sure, thank you. Devin, local twenty-two. Yeah, question for Governor Scott. So, um, one of the goals now for the legislature when it comes to pensions um, is creating that task force over the summer and fall. Um, to take a closer look at the benefit structure. As someone who has been kind of sounding the alarm on this for a while, what do you think realistically a task force might be able to do here when it comes to, you know, trying to think of outside of the box solutions? And is there anything in particular that you think this task force should really kind of hone in on that you've noticed? Well, I, I don't know any of the details um, about the task force and the makeup of the task force and who it will represent, um, but any time we can get people together to educate them on what the problem is and how it started and where we are today and what this means in the future, uh, I think is uh, is essential and, and will be uh, helpful in the discussions as we go into the future. So um, I, again, I don't know what they uh, are looking at, but, uh, but I think uh, they just need you know, some more education. Because when you start talking about uh, pensions and OPEBs and, you know, you start losing people fairly quick because it's uh, it's tough to understand how we got to where we are today and, and how do we prevent it from happening in the future and how do we rectify it today. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see what the makeup is. I haven't had uh, any opportunity to, to look at what they're proposing, and I don't know if it's just the the House is proposing this, or whether the Senate uh, has a, a say in this, or whether it's a bill they're trying to pass. I just, I just don't know any of the spe uh, specifics at this point. And then a quick question for Secretary Smith. So, 40 plus opening up on Monday. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I would assume that's one of the largest, if not the largest, age group. And with the other ones coming in short order, is there anything? being done as far as getting the website prepared for all that traffic, the call center. Um, is it pretty much the same process and are you um, confident that it'll go pretty smoothly or is there anything changing now that we're gonna have all of these age bands in pretty short order coming up? I, uh, I think we're confident in uh, what we're doing at this point. I don't believe it's the largest age band. Uh, I think the largest might have been the 60 to 70 or 50 to 60, but I'll let Secretary Smith answer. Devin, it was the only press conference I didn't bring the age band, uh, breakdowns on, but um, with the population in each, but it certainly is not the, going to be the largest age band. Uh, the largest age band is going to be a 16 plus. Um, that will be the, that will be the largest um, age band. We're confident that we can handle the traffic uh, with our um, with our 
uh, website, and we've, we're confident as the population gets younger, we're s starting to see everybody starting to register on the website uh, and less traffic on the call center. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not busy in the, those first um, few hours of opening up. It is busy in those first few hours, but we're confident that these um, that our systems are going to be able to handle this, especially as uh, people get younger and are more accustomed uh, to using um, the uh, the website, and, and the website can handle a lot. Uh, so we're we're fairly confident. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Tom, Compass, Vermont. Hi, Tom. Thanks for thank you, Rebecca. Vermont has uh, gotten a fair amount of national press since it announced that the state would open up vaccine registration to all college on April 30th. But the reality is that the, it will be virtually impossible for any out-of-state student in Vermont to complete that two-dose regimen, maybe even not the single dose, before the school year, and making them either have to return to the state for the summer for a second dose or for go getting it at all. Sure. Uh, what was the thinking behind the announcement given when you do the have an actionable uh, date for people to take advantage? Well, again, I think I described that uh, earlier, but we wanted to open up 16 to 30 uh, Vermont first. Uh, those who are uh, in college, for instance, uh, that are planning to spend the summer here, we wanted them, them to have the opportunity, as well as those in high school uh, so that they could uh, participate in a, a somewhat of a, a milestone, their graduation and so forth. So we wanted to give them the opportunity to, uh, to have their vaccinations. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see. We want to just get through that, give them the opportunity, everyone an opportunity to sign up and then open it up uh, to uh, college uh, students that aren't planning on staying in Vermont, as well as uh, those from out of state that, who have second homes here, who may have wintered uh, in other uh, areas of the country, and uh, that we have an uh, ability for them to get vaccinated as well. So uh, that that date uh, could is flexible in some respects. As I said before, it all depends on supply and demand. And if we uh, have more supply and if we have uh, fewer people signing up, that, uh, that, that could be moved forward. We just don't know at this point. Uh, but we, um, we thought it was uh, uh, important uh, that we describe what we meant uh, by, you know, there was some confusion about who would uh, be um, uh, able to get their, their vaccinations, those who were in college. We wanted to make sure that we had that definition. Uh, so they could determine themselves whether they uh, would be able to get into the first uh, band, um, but um, but then have a date uh, that they could look forward to and make their plans. Now, I don't know, uh, this might be a, more of a question for others, but if you have uh, one dose, um, it does get you 80% there, uh, and, uh, and I'm not sure what the other states would do, whether they give you the second dose or not, I would suspect there would be an opportunity to do so. Uh, Dr. Levine. Yeah, I think it's a common misconception to think that people will be left kind of stranded. Uh, one thing you should know is that there were some college students this semester who actually were qualified to be 1A because they were EMTs and they'd gotten their first dose of vaccine in the state they lived in and then came here for their semester. Um, and we weren't going to force them to go back and travel and all the dangers incurred in that with regard to the virus. Uh, so they became part of our 1A group because in fact, that's the function they were holding in society. There's going to be enough supply for every state by the time the second dose would come around for these college students that they'll be readily available to them in the other states. And I think that kind of reciprocal arrangement that we had with these students will will hold at that time so your so the belief is that you would tell students who decided to get a first dose if they could get one in before having to leave for the end of the semester uh, that it will be incumbent upon them to find the second dose where they live uh, otherwise how do the travel restrictions impact them if they can't and they have to come back to the state for the second one 
Yeah, I, I, I just sincerely don't believe they're going to be forced to come back to the state uh, to get their second dose. Um, it's just, it's not, it's going to be a departure from reality. Um, there's, like I say, the states will have abundant vaccine. Many of them will already be transitioning from mass vaccination sites to private offices and practices. So it's not going to become a big issue for that group. And it's the same, you know, and the vaccines, you know, there's no new vaccine available that I'm aware of yet. So it's the same two um, mRNA vaccines that we're talking about that these students might be getting. So they'll be getting the same dose at the right interval. So it won't be, uh, it won't be complicated. I really don't think so. Okay, thanks. So one last question. Uh, a significant amount of time in this conference and previous ones has aptly focused on the population living in Vermont who has health conditions put them at greater risk. Um, given the outbreak, particularly among younger people and certainly on college campuses, has or will uh, the administration consider allowing any students, college students with health risks to register for a vaccine earlier? That's 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 happened already. Because so they've been those wanted to who had health risks who were out of state college students were able to get a vaccination. They have not they have not been included at this time. Is there consideration given the outbreak among younger people to allow out of state students with health risks to register earlier? It's not something that we have discussed. I think we, we could take that under advisement, but at the same time, I wouldn't want to call it an outbreak amongst younger students. It's part of a surge in cases across the state that 50% of cases are under age 40. Um, it's not all students by any means. And in fact, our students are so heavily tested that we know the percentage of the students is not that high um, because they're under a once and sometimes twice a week testing protocol. So it sounds like something you're really thinking there. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much. We received a question from a school nurse just asking how the um, new three-foot distancing guidelines would affect who is considered a close contact within schools. Uh, Secretary French, are you still on? Yes, I am, Governor. Yes, thanks. Uh, it, currently, it does not affect uh, the contact tracing uh, definitions, but we are working on that. So that could potentially change? It could, uh, but that's not something that will be enacted initially with a change in our, our distancing guidance. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Greg Bennington Banner. Uh, hello, uh, this is either for Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith. Uh, this is regarding the, uh, the session you held with employees at the Vermont Veterans Home. I was just wondering if you could characterize the tenor of this session, because I'm trying to understand why that group of um, employees uh, is still resistant to accepting the vaccine, and if there was any indication of what's going on there. Mr. Levine. <clears throat> so... Uh I have to answer that because I was present along with some other members of my uh, health department staff uh, who specifically work on outbreaks in long-term care facilities. Um, the tenor was actually polite and fine. It was actually quite quiet. There was no uh, um, major bringing up of you know, major resistance to vaccine. Uh, questions were asked and answered. The session was recorded because not everyone who works in a direct patient-facing um, position there could be there. Um, they, some of them were working, some of them weren't on site and weren't hooked into the meeting. So it was, it was uh, intentionally recorded so that they would at least get to see it. The reason we want to go back is because while that's wonderful that they could view a recorded session, the real goal of this is to get at each person's concerns. 
and make sure that we have a frank discussion about those concerns and issues so we understand better and they can hear our responses better and to really have them understand it's a safe environment to talk with us about this in so that we're not there to coerce them or twist their arm or just lecture them about how wonderful the vaccine is, but we really want to get an idea of where we can help them make inroads. If they've been hesitant, why? And can, through education and uh, responding to their specific needs, can we move them forward? Uh, so that's sort of how that went. Uh, and we're looking forward to being able to have the opportunity to uh, do that again. Um, were you able? Were you able to, um, for lack of a better metaphor, make any converts there? Um, yes. Through that session. Yes, uh, we were told by the uh, uh, leadership there that I believe the number was 10 to 12 people subsequently uh, did um, get vaccinated. We thought that was great. Thank you very much. You know, we thought that was great, but as Secretary uh, Smith said earlier, their still overall rate is below 50% for the patient facing people. So we want to do better. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Guy Page, Chronicles of Vermont State House. Governor H-172 <coughs> would ban trapping except by licensed nuisance trappers. It was discussed this week in House Natural Resources. What do you think about a legislative ban on trapping? Um, again, uh, this is a bill that is being discussed in one committee. Um, in all probability, it won't get out of committee uh, and it won't get any action. On the uh, in the Senate, um, my uh, my personal uh, preference is that we uh, continue to adhere to some of our traditions. Uh, we do so in a safe manner and make sure that we adhere to all the guidelines within the program. Hopefully, guys, oh, okay. Okay. We'll go to Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Thanks, Rebecca. Some local parents and teens who are 16 and 17 years old want to know how the state will ensure that they have adequate access to the Pfizer vaccine, the only one they can get, especially since they'll be jockeying for appointments with the 18 to 29-year-olds who are eligible for all three vaccines. How will the state manage this? And does the state intend to hold school-based vaccine clinics? Yeah, we've been contemplating all of those uh, because we, again, wanted to make sure uh, that we allowed for an opportunity for those 16, seven, 16 to 18 year olds uh, to get the uh, the only one uh, um, one manufacturer uh, that uh, is available to them, and that being Pfizer. So we've been discussing what uh, what we'll do, uh, but uh, Secretary Smith yeah. might have more details on that. Yeah, we've discussed a number of options from school base to um, uh, to sort of megapods uh, along the way. I think where we're going to come down, Lisa, at some point here is probably a community based uh, uh, vaccination sites and making sure that there's enough Pfizer uh, for these uh, 16 year olds at these various regional sites. So we're trying to make sure that um, we have enough Pfizer for this uh, for this group and you know 16 to 18 making sure that uh, there is enough Pfizer for this group and that's what we're doing right now we're putting the plans together for that uh, I think we'll probably have more in the next seven days or so great thank you and just a quick follow-up question actually not a follow-up a tax question will Vermont follow the IRS on unemployment on the unemployment exclusion even though the tax returns are now due May 17th, the due date for first quarter estimates is still April 15th for the IRS. Some readers want to know if Vermont, what Vermont's going to do related to the unemployment exclusion in order to complete their taxes and also to be able to pay their first quarter estimates by April 15th to avoid penalties. Yeah, I, 
I believe so, um, but um, but I also believe it's tied to a bill. Um, Secretary Young, do you have the details on that? Um, I'm sorry, Governor. I didn't hear the question very well. Was the uh, it was tax question about that? You want me to repeat it? Yes, if you could. That Lisa. would be great. Thank you. It's about the due date for the unemployed. It's about the even though tax returns are now due May 17th, the due date for the first quarter estimate remains April 15th for the IRS. And our readers want to know if Vermont's going to match that. I'm sorry, if, if Vermont's going to do, <laughs> wait, here comes a sentence. Readers want to know what Vermont's going to do related to the unemployment exclusion in order to complete their taxes and pay the first quarter estimate to avoid penalties. If, if you if that say that. The exclusion yes. for the unemployment? Yes. Okay, so um, our, our tax code does not automatically link up to the federal code. So the tax commissioner has been in the legislature since that exemption um, became uh, law, federal law, just a few weeks ago after tax season had opened. Um, and he is working with legislators in, in an attempt to get our um, two codes linked so that that exemption will be treated the same as it is by the federal government. Um, I'm not sure today if that has made any progress. Uh, I think they were hoping to attach it to a bill that, that may be passed out next week. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. That's it. All right, thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you again on Tuesday. Have a happy Easter for those who celebrate.